God, oh my God, please God, please God. Oh my God, please keep the horses safe, please God, please. <laughs> The most complex systems ever created was the pattern of detonations inside the atomic bomb that began the chain reaction. The scientist who created it, a physicist called John von Neumann, said that there was only one thing as complex. It was the world's climate. Like the bomb, it was a mass of different forces moving around a central globe. Von Neumann then used an early computer to build a model that simulated the world's climate system. His aim was to use it to predict and manipulate the weather as a weapon with which to attack the Soviet Union. But what he began had another consequence. In 1961, a scientist called Edward Lorenz made a mistake which revealed something that astonished him. Lorenz had built his own computer model of the world's climate. Then one day, he ran a program that he had run many times before, but missed out one tiny piece of data, a change at the fourth decimal point. For 30 days, everything went as before. But then suddenly, the computer began to predict weather conditions never seen before on the planet. Other scientists said that his model was at fault. But Lorentz ran it again and again with tiny variations. And each time, it led to different, often very strange, futures. He began to wonder whether the world's climate was not the stable, self-correcting system that other scientists believed. That it was unstable. And that one tiny change somewhere in the world could tip the whole system from one state into another. In America in the 1960s, there was a man who was convinced that there was something frightening 
hidden under the surface of the new, modern suburbs. Behind what looked like a confident individualism that was rising up throughout America, there were really hidden fears eating away at people from inside. Oh, these are gorgeous. Look, There were feelings of anxiety, loneliness and emptiness. And he was convinced he could make a lot of money out of these feelings. He was called Arthur Sackler. Sackler had trained as a psychiatrist, but in the 1950s had turned to advertising drugs and medicines to doctors. And more and more of the doctors he talked with told him about people from the suburbs coming to them with vague feelings of anxiety and fear, something the doctors didn't know how to deal with. And in 1963, the company Hoffman La Roche hired Sackler to promote a new drug called Valium. He offered it to the doctors as an extraordinary new way to treat these inner anxieties. And he said, it wasn't dangerous or addictive. Valium became an amazing success. By 1971, it was the most widely prescribed medication in the Western world. Hoffman's plant in New Jersey turned out 30 million pills in 15 hours, enough to satisfy global consumption for just five days. Valium had touched on something inside human beings, but nobody knew what it was. The new wave of feminists pointed out that far more women than men were taking Valium. They said the drug was being used to blot out the feeling that millions of women were having but there was something badly wrong with their lives. That when they did what they were supposed to, it didn't bring the happiness they had been promised. And I thought to myself, well, I, uh, there's got to be a better way for, for me. And I went about it in the way that I wanted to. I did what I wanted, regardless of what society was saying. And then it all kind of caved in on me, and I just figured, well, you know, what's the use? And so I ended up in the, the state hospital. But now that I'm on the road back, I found if I, I don't see there is any solution, because if I act the way society tells me to act and do abide by the rules, my life is fine and everybody's happy. But Arthur Sackler suspected that the drug had touched on something much deeper that the women who spent their days alone in their new suburban homes were in a kind of laboratory of the future. They had discovered, before anyone else, the underlying weakness with the new individualism. That you were free, but you were alone. Women told researchers, I feel empty somehow, or I feel as if I don't exist. Sackler knew, more and more men were also beginning to take the drug. The women had just got there first. The Dream of the Red Chamber is the most famous novel in China's history. It was written 250 years before, in the 18th century. It tells the story of the rise and fall of two powerful families. As their power declines, the characters begin to find that the line between reality and a dream world gets blurred. 
They slip back and forth between the two. Zhang Qing, the wife of Mao Zedong, had always been fascinated by the Dream of the Red Chamber because it seemed to show that it is the power of a ruling class that shapes the very nature of reality itself. And it was that idea that had driven her in the Cultural Revolution. She had wanted to create a mass force, powerful enough to change the very way millions of Chinese people saw the world. But suddenly, Mao Zedong had turned on her. He brutally dismissed all her ideas. And she began to realize that maybe he had been using her. That Mao had used the mass frenzy that she had created simply as a way of getting rid of his enemies. It meant that everything that she had created, the epic operas and ballets that promised a new kind of reality in the future, had just been flimsy illusions to disguise what had really been a brutal struggle for power. And now Mao had sent the Red Guards, who had been the source of her power, off to the distant deserts and mountains. Zhang Qing was increasingly alone and frightened because Mao was turning on all those who had helped him in the Cultural Revolution. He tricked the head of the People's Army, Lin Biao, into plotting a coup. Mao sent troops to arrest Lin, but he and his family managed to escape on a plane. But the plane ran out of fuel and crashed in the desolate mountains of Mongolia. Zhang Qing was terrified that she would be next. She mounted anti-aircraft guns on the roof of her house in the party compound. She ate meals at random times to avoid being poisoned. And she suspected the nurse who gave her sleeping pills of being an assassin. Zhang Qing's own sense of reality was beginning to dissolve. But she also realized that with Lin Biao destroyed, she now had a much greater chance of taking power when Mao died. In 1967, the Russians launched a space flight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the revolution. It was called Soyuz 1. Everything seemed to be going normally, but the astronaut knew that something terrible was likely to happen. He was called Vladimir Komarov. Komarov's best friend was the Soviet hero Yuri Gagarin who had made the first human flight into space. As they prepared for the launch, Gagarin had inspected Komarov's spacecraft. He discovered hundreds of faults in its construction. He told Komarov what he had found, that the spacecraft was a death trap. Gagarin tried to get the launch stopped, but the Communist Party leaders refused. The launch had to go ahead, they said, to celebrate the anniversary of the revolution. Komarov went, but on one condition. If he died, his body should be displayed in an open coffin. Things went wrong from the start. The spacecraft lost power. Komarov tried to manually guide it back to Earth, but then the parachutes failed to open. An American listening post on the Russian border recorded Komarov's final cries of rage as he plunged to his death on the plains of Kazakhstan. Oh, 
Komarov's remains were put into an open casket at the space headquarters. It was his revenge. It showed in a shocking way how the power of the Soviet leaders was crumbling and how deeply the communist dream had become corrupted. Edward Lomonov grew up in Ukraine in the 1950s. His father worked in a lowly position in the Ministry of Internal Security. They were in charge of watching and reporting on people to make sure that everyone was a good communist. Limonov admired his father as a Soviet hero. And often his father would travel to Siberia by train for his work. One evening after his father had been away, Limonov went to the station to meet him as he returned. But his father didn't appear. Limonov searched and found another train hidden away in the sidings. He watched dozens of men in handcuffs being taken off the train and put into trucks. Each one was called out by a man with a clipboard. The man was his father. Later that night, Limonov overheard his father tell his mother that all the men were being sent to a prison to be shot because they were against the system. Limonov realized that there was another violent, hidden reality in the Soviet system that reached everywhere, even into his own family. And he decided he would be against the system. He would become a dissident. is symbolic of much of the dilemma of Appalachia. Until very recently, the companies that mined the coal owned all the mining communities. They owned the mines themselves, the tipples, the company towns, the streets, the houses, the stores, the commissaries, the hotels, the hospitals. They even had their own brand of money, script, which circulated only in company commissaries and uh, stores. This created a population that was totally dependent, and the dependency lasted for more than 40 years. Abruptly, a few years ago, the company no longer needed its mining men. It needed mining machines. So the company withdrew its paternalism in each of the mining valleys. Millions hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars worth of coal have gone out of these valleys. Appalachia has produced essentially two crops of people, the rich who have followed the coal and the poor who have stayed here in the Appalachian Valley. Harry Caldwell was a lawyer in the giant coal mining area that stretched across the Cumberland Mountains in Appalachia. He had spent his life representing the miners, taking on and fighting those who owned the mines. But now he had realized that something fundamental was happening. The power of the miners all around him was beginning to dissolve and collapse. He wrote a book called Night Comes to the Cumberlands. He described how coal had not only brought wealth and power to those who owned the mines, but also to the miners themselves. It gave them power 
because it brought thousands of them together. And together, they could block the coal from leaving the valleys. It gave them enormous collective power, out of which organised labour had come. For 40 years, they had mounted strikes and blockades and fought violent battles with the private armies of the mine owners. And out of that had come strong leaders who had used the collective power to change society for the better. In 1946, the United Mine Workers of America, under the leadership of John L. Lewis, who is generally regarded as the greatest labor statesman in American history, undertook to raise the medical standards of this area. Lewis, in a very dramatic confrontation with the American coal operators at Pittsburgh, you have, he said, made dead more than half a million of your fellow citizens. The product you sell in the markets of the world is drenched with the blood of your workmen. It is salted with the tears of their widows and their orphans. And he said, beginning today, beginning immediately, and at this bargaining table, you will begin to redress this old injustice. The United Mine Workers Health and Welfare Fund came into existence the following year. It was comparable in many respects to the National Health Service in Great Britain. But now, Cordell realized that that power had gone. First, the machines had come and replaced thousands of workers. Helpless to save their jobs, they now lived in growing poverty, supported only by welfare. And then there was the other fossil fuel, oil. Oil was now rising up to replace coal. And more and more of it came from the Middle East. In countries like Saudi Arabia, the Western oil companies had created their own managed communities. But these communities were for the managers, who lived a dreamlike existence in the middle of the desert. Their golf courses created by rolling crude oil into the sand. While the workers were controlled by authoritarian governments, they were no threat. And across the world, the oil industry was a scattered, diffused network, where there was never any chance of enough workers coming together to create a critical mass, out of which would come collective action. very moment, something was revealed in another remote part of the world that was going to lead to a realisation that fossil fuels could not only change the nature of power, they could also change the whole structure of the planet. On the top of the world, below the surface of a giant ice cap, a city is buried. Camp Century is buried below the surface of this ice cap. Beneath it, the ice descends for 6,000 feet. In this remote setting, Camp Century is a symbol of man's unceasing struggle to conquer his environment. Camp Century pretended to be a scientific base. In reality, it was a disguise for Project Iceworm. 600 nuclear missiles were going to be hidden in hundreds of miles of tunnels under the ice, targeted at Russia. But as a part of the disguise, climate scientists, working with army engineers, began to drill hundreds of feet down into the ice and bring up ice cores. The ice sheet had been built up 
layer by layer, over hundreds of thousands of years. That meant that it had within it a frozen record of the past. What the scientists found in the cores astonished them. That 11,000 years before, there had been a sudden cataclysmic shift. The world's temperature had changed by 10 degrees in just centuries. Other ice cores then confirmed this. That in the past, there had been repeated sudden changes, both heating and cooling, of the world's climate at speeds that no one thought possible. This piece of ice records a spectacular cooling. In fact, it's a quite new discovery for us that the Earth can turn so cold so fast. What was the reason? We don't think the volcanic eruptions did it. Maybe it was due to enormous breakout of Antarctic ice. The problem is, could that happen again to us right now? Or could we accidentally provoke such a catastrophe? We must find the reason for this natural event long ago. They believe that what the ice cores showed was that the idea which dominated science, that the world's climate was a stable, self-correcting system, was wrong. That it could suddenly shift into a completely different state, which would have extraordinary consequences. Richard Nixon came to power because he had harnessed a new force. He called it the silent majority. They were the people in the suburbs that were rapidly growing around every city in America. But it was a fragile power base because it wasn't like the old collective power that had driven political parties in the past. It was millions of individuals who not only felt isolated and alone, but also increasingly fearful of the chaos in America as a result of the Vietnam War. We were sitting in the living room watching the Miss Ohio pageant, and all of a sudden I heard a, a smack at the front, and I run out, and then I heard something hit a window here in the back. And I tore around the, or the driveway here, and I looked all over, but I didn't see a thing. I didn't see one guy. You know, you can put up with this crap just so long, and then, pow, somebody's going to get it. There are those who say, how do we answer those who engage in violence? How do we answer those who try to shout down a speaker? And my answer is, don't answer in kind. It's time for the great silent majority just to stand up and be counted. Nixon promised to represent the silent majority. But the truth was that he was also uncertain and frightened too, just like them. Nixon had been to see a psychiatrist about his feelings of dread. He told the psychiatrist that when he looked in the mirror in the morning, it was as if there was no one there. He was also suspicious and paranoid. Nixon was convinced that there was a conspiracy by what he called the liberal establishment to destroy him. In 1971, he told his aides to start what he called the enemies list. It included dozens of liberal journalists, academics, and even film stars. Nixon had a tape machine running all the time in the White House. And on it, he left a record of this paranoia. And also, 
Nixon soon found that the chaos created by the Vietnam War was also going to stop him delivering the new stable America that he had promised. The cost of the war was huge and America was deeply in debt. In 1971, it forced Nixon to give up one of the great symbols of America's global power, the control of all the world's currencies. Ever since the Second World War, the value of all currencies in the world had been fixed to the dollar. They were backed by the gold reserves held in Fort Knox. But then overnight, Nixon let that go. And suddenly, there was no fixed value for any currency anywhere in the world. What was that mark, John? 838 and 43. 843, I can deal with you in sterling mark. And dollars, just a second. Dollars, Chris. 244.50 to the dollar sterling. There was immediately confusion as banks around the world struggled to come to terms with the new reality. They set up new improvised dealing rooms, buying and selling currencies, as minute by minute they went up and down in value. But then President Nixon did something that seemed to show he still had power to change the world. He went to China. His arrival was broadcast live in America. Journalists compared it to the moon landings because Nixon was going to a giant, mysterious country that had been cut off from the rest of the world for decades. And he was going to bring it into the modern global system. By now, Mao could hardly walk. The Americans had sent medical equipment ahead in case of an assassination attempt on Nixon. But the Chinese took it and used it instead to resuscitate Mao. The meeting lasted for only an hour. Mao went back to bed, and Nixon didn't see him again. Instead, he went with Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, to see one of her revolutionary operas. On the surface, Jiang Qing seemed confident, but underneath, she realized that she could be destroyed at any minute. It wasn't just Mao. By now, the whole system of authority in China was beginning to fall apart, as many of those in power realized that the revolution had failed. While Jiang Qing was preoccupied with real enemies, Nixon, sitting next to her, had now become obsessed with plotting to destroy his imaginary enemies. He had set up a conspiracy based in the White House. It was run by a group of ex-intelligence agents, and they were already planning to bug, burgle, and blackmail Nixon's opponents. Behind his smile, he was preoccupied with plotting and scheming. Jiang Qing and Richard Nixon were two of the most powerful people in the world at that moment. But what they shared was a sense that power was now slipping from their grasp. While the new force that Nixon had unleashed money, was eating away at the idea that there was a fixed, predictable system that any politician could control. Because the bankers had realised that currencies could be traded globally, like any other asset. And what that had created was a fluid, constantly changing reality that no one was fully in control of. 
Hello, 3542. It dropped 100 points. We don't know why. It just dropped 100 points when everything else was staying steady. 30 other way. 30 other way. Change it. Change. Yeah. 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 Все на белом свете люди издавна повторяются. Было, есть и снова будет так. Но для всех, для всех влюбленных песня заново начинается. Было, есть и снова будет так. Будет так, будет так, будет так. Будет так, было есть и снова будет так. У любви свои законы, сердце разума не послушает. Было есть и снова будет так. Даже в худшие минуты людям верится только в лучшие. Было, есть и снова будет так. Будет так, будет так, будет так, будет так. Было, есть и снова будет так. Edward Limonov had now left Ukraine and come to Moscow. He became part of what was called the underground. Writers and painters who saw themselves as the opponents of the regime. Limonov became a poet. And one night at a party, he met a girl who he fell passionately in love with. She was called Yelena Shapova. And together, they became a glamorous couple in the underground world. But what Limonov began to discover was that most of the dissidents did not have a clear idea of what alternative they wanted. They too were trapped by the Soviet ideology. The most famous dissident was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was secretly writing a novel that was going to expose the horror behind the communist facade. It was called the Gulag Archipelago. But in the novel, Solzhenitsyn also confronted the fact that faced by the failure of the revolutionary dream, it was now difficult to believe in anything. That maybe ideology itself was the problem. The evildoers in Shakespeare, he said, killed just a few dozen in their struggle for power. But then came the belief that you could find a theory that would create an ideal world. The agents of the Inquisition, he said, invoked Christianity. The great empires like Britain justified it by the idea of civilization. The Nazis did it by race. And the revolutionaries, both in France and in Russia, justified it by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. But in every case, he said, thousands and often millions were killed. Solzhenitsyn's book contained a damning conclusion, which was going to be one of the foundations of the counter ideology that dominates the world today. It said that the only way to escape from that horror was to stop trying to change the world, stop trying to reshape reality. Instead, the safest thing to do in the future was to believe in nothing. Limonov scorned Solzhenitsyn. He saw him as part of an older generation, trapped by their literary elitism. Ever since his time in Ukraine, he had been fascinated by what he saw as the real outsiders, those who refused in any way to be a part of the Soviet system. Above all, the thousands of criminals who lived most of their lives in the Russian prisons. They were called the Vorvi Zakonye, thieves in law. 
They had their own codes and hierarchies that were expressed in the complex tattoos on their bodies. The tattoos also expressed their fundamental belief that in a society where ideology controlled the minds of everyone, the only way to step outside the system was through violent crime. A singer called Arkady Sevigny had secretly recorded what were called prison songs. Songs from the Vorvi Zakonye inside the jails that attacked not just the Soviets, but the whole Russian Empire. Не надо грустить, господа офицеры, что мы потеряли, уже не вернусь. Пусть нету отечества, нету уши веры, и кровью отмечен нелегкий наш путь. Пусть нету отечества, нету уж веры, И кровью отмечен нелегкий наш путь. Снимаешь, что ли, все? Ну что там? Интересно. But then at the start of 1974, the Soviet leaders discovered what Solzhenitsyn had been writing. They debated whether to shoot him but decided instead to expel him to the West. They also decided to take the opportunity to get rid of some of the other dissidents as well. Edward Limonov and Yelena were summoned to KGB headquarters and told that they were being sent to New York. While many of the leading criminals, the Vorvi Zakonye, were taken from the prisons and put on planes to New York as well, the Soviets told the Americans that they were another group of Jews who were being allowed to emigrate. Most of the Russian criminals set up home in Brighton Beach, just outside New York. They created their own organization called the Potato Bag Gang. It was the start of the modern Russian mafia in America. Limonov and Yelena were helped by Russian emigre writers and artists already in Manhattan. And they soon became a glamorous couple, invited to parties by rich Americans who wanted to meet Soviet dissidents. But the New York Limonov had arrived in was not the city of his dreams. Much of it was falling apart, with gangs burning down whole buildings for insurance claims. But a strange, unreal mood spread through the ruins. Well, this morning on the way into work, we had a report that the uh, police had located a carcass on, uh, in a street on 172nd and Bryant turned out to be a uh, stripped carcass of a gorilla. It was headless, and the uh, fur was removed, the skin was removed. South Bronx. <laughs> there was also a mood of paranoia spreading through America. Nixon's own paranoia had been exposed by the Watergate scandal. But in its wake, all kinds of other revelations came out, of dark secrets in the political world that had been kept hidden from the people that for 20 years, the CIA had been planning assassinations and overthrowing leaders of foreign governments all around the world, using poisons and specially made secret weapons. Don't, don't point it at me. <laughs> no. does, does this, does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman, and a special one was developed which would be able to enter the target without perception. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? Yes. The uncertainty even infected those who had previously ridiculed all conspiracy theories. Six years before, Kerry Thornley had begun Operation Mindfuck. He and his friend Greg Hill 
had planted fake conspiracy theories in the press and in underground magazines, alleging that the Illuminati were the secret organization behind all the assassinations in America. Their aim was to make people see how absurd all such theories were. But one day in New York, Thornley thought that he recognized the picture of one of the Watergate burglars on a magazine stand. He was certain he had met him 20 years before in New Orleans. Back then, Thornley had been friends with Lee Harvey Oswald. They had met when they were Marines together. Thornley had then lived in New Orleans, the same city that Oswald had lived in before the assassination. And he had met people there who later became suspects in the Kennedy conspiracy. Thornley had always seen these as coincidences, but in the new mood, he started to doubt. I had met Guy Bannister, uh, a figure, a suspect in the garrison probe. I had met Clay Shaw two weeks before the assassination and a, a discussion of my book about Oswald, the Idle Warriors, was involved. I had even worked in a, in a restaurant where Oswald had lived in his youth uh, with his mother right upstairs mm -hmm. right in the same building. So uh, there were co meaningful coincidences and meaningless coincidences, but I could not explain all these weird coincidences. But at the same time, the fake conspiracy theories that Thornley had been spreading into American culture with Operation Mindfuck ever since the late 1960s started to be believed as well. Because the real conspiracies were so extraordinary. Stories about the Illuminati and a plot to create a new world order began to get mixed up with revelations about brainwashing and secret mind control programs run by the CIA. And the line between the reality of political corruption and a dream world of conspiracy theories started to get blurred in America. But the sense of uncertainty and a feeling that systems might be out of control was also creeping into other areas. A group of climate scientists had begun to argue that the world might be on the edge of another dramatic change there might be a cataclysmic crisis coming, and that the reason this time was human activity. In the 1970s, there seemed to be dramatic shifts happening in the climate. In regions near the equator, there were droughts and famines. But in the Arctic regions, it was getting colder. Something was happening, but no one knew what. One group said that there was going to be a dramatic cooling because the dust and smoke spreading around the world was blocking out the sunlight. A man-made dust pall is spreading over the earth. This dust blots out the sun and causes cooling on a worldwide scale. Not all scientists agree with this theory. I hope it's wrong myself, but there is no doubting its seriousness. For if this is correct, millions of people will be destined for chronic famine. But others said the very opposite was about to happen. There was more and more carbon dioxide being pumped into the atmosphere. That would trap the heat, and the world would grow hotter. And the key force behind that was the hydrocarbon, oil. In the mid-1970s, oil was about to play a crucial role that would increase the uncertain mood that today has come to dominate Western societies. A feeling that we are somehow surrounded by global systems, both natural and those made by humans themselves, that are beyond control. Systems so complex and unpredictable that they make a mockery of the idea that national governments can shape and control the world. A hundred years before, coal had done the same. 
It had brought millions of people into the new industrial cities, where they worked for the men who owned the vast wealth that the coal had created. And that money was so powerful that it seemed to control everything. Not just people's lives, but politics as well. But slowly, out of that, came a challenge to that power, based on the workers organising together. And from that came the idea of mass democracy, that the role of politicians was to represent the mass of the people against the powerful. But now, oil was about to start something that was going to undermine that idea. This is King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. He's going to have a great deal to say in the next few years about the way you live. He rules over a desert kingdom of six million people. In this decade of the oil shortage, he's one of the most powerful men in the world. Under these sands, there are proved deposits of 160 billion barrels of oil. Starting in 1973, the Arab countries, led by King Faisal, decided to use oil as a weapon. They wanted to force America to stop supporting Israel. And they did with oil just what the miners had done with coal in the past. The Arabs blocked supplies and then suddenly raised the price four times. It was a dramatic exercise of power and it caused chaos in the American economy. As a friend of the United States, we are deeply concerned that if the United States does not change its policy in the Middle East and continues to side with Zionism, then I'm afraid such course of action will affect our relations with our American friends because it will place us in untenable position in the Arab world and vis-a-vis -vis the countries which Zionism seeks to destroy. For almost three decades, we have been the richest, most powerful nation on Earth. Now, a nation of six million warns us we must change our foreign policy if we want full gas tanks. It had a dramatic effect. Money suddenly poured into the Arab world. Within three years, Saudi Arabia had more foreign currency than Japan, Germany and the United States put together. But the Arab governments had no idea what to do with this vast new wealth. So they turned for help to the Western banks. The banks realized that they could take these petrodollars and turn them into a new kind of international currency, free of all government control. And soon, politicians from all around the world were coming to the new headquarters of the Western banks to elaborate signing ceremonies, where they borrowed billions of the petrodollars. That global financial system that President Nixon had created by accident a few years before now became a giant force, one that held the destiny of millions of people in its hands. And politicians became increasingly convinced they couldn't control. And the money started to take charge of politics once again. It was only the beginning, because another component was about to be fitted into this growing new system of power. In China, as Mao approached death, Jiang Qing was still determined to take his place as the leader. But there was one person who was equally determined to stop her. He was called Deng Xiaoping. Deng was one of the original revolutionaries and he had been sidelined during the Cultural Revolution. But now, Deng believed that if Jiang Qing was allowed to take power, it would be a disaster for China, and the country could splinter into civil war. An anonymous poem appeared on a wall in Tiananmen Square. It was obviously addressed to Jiang Qing. Lady X, it said, you are insane. To be empress is your ambition. 
Instead, take this mirror and see what you are really like. You deceive your superiors and you delude your subordinates. Yet for types like you, good times won't last. Then Mao died. Zhang Qing came on her own, dressed in black. She was already preparing to take power with three others of the leadership. They were called the Gang of Four. But another group, backed by Deng Xiaoping, set out to destroy them. Wall posters went up all across China, attacking the Gang of Four, claiming that as well as being corrupt, they were really working for the CIA to undermine China. When Zhang Qing came to Ta Chai, there seemed to be no end to her whims. Now she wanted her room sprayed with perfume. Then she wanted more carpets on the floor. And for curtains, she wanted to have special ones of a particular dark color. Chang Qing and company demanded complete quietitude. No one should laugh or talk loudly. Planes at a nearby airport had to stop their sorties. People had to be sent uphill to beat the woods to drive the birds away. And four weeks after Mao's death, army units came in the middle of the night and arrested Zhang Qing. She was put in an underground cell next to the refrigeration unit that was holding Mao's body. She later tried to commit suicide by hitting her head against the wall. So the soldiers covered the walls with rubber. Within 18 months, Deng Xiaoping defeated all other rivals, and he took power in China. The first thing he did was wipe the past everywhere. In Shanghai, the giant sign that said, Long live the victory of Chairman Mao's revolutionary road, was taken down. Outside the Department of Public Tranquility in Beijing, which in reality was the headquarters of the secret police, the thoughts of Chairman Mao were also removed. Deng then set out to create a new kind of revolution. He was going to bring capitalism into China, but the state would control and manage the whole system. His aim was simple money would replace the old revolutionary dreams. It was less dangerous. But he was going to use it to restore China's power. Deng Xiaoping knew that in the 19th century, the British had used drugs to control the Chinese. They had brought opium to China. It led to what the Chinese called the century of humiliation. Now, Deng was determined to reverse that, to reassert China's power. You couldn't use drugs because the Americans already had their own drugs. Instead, he was going to use the mass mobilization of the Chinese people to invent another force that would be the equivalent of opium, a kind of mass consumerism never seen before in the world, driven by goods so cheap that everyone in the West would want them. Whole cities were going to be built in China that made just one kind of product. And they would be shipped in vast quantities to the West. You gave up on utopian ideas about the future and didn't believe in anything any longer, apart from the money. 
and his allies in this would be the Western banks and their new system of global lending. Because the banks would lend millions of people in the West the money to buy the Chinese goods, just like they had been lending to governments all around the world. It was going to be the perfect system. Edward Lemonov was now all alone in New York. He had published an article attacking the other emigres, so they all dropped him. Then Yelena, the woman he loved more than anything else in the world, met a photographer who promised to make her a model. He seduced her and she left Limonov. Without love or money, Limonov became destitute. He lived in the cheapest hotel, surrounded by prostitutes and drug addicts. And he spent his days and nights wandering the city, alone. While all around him, the newly powerful banks were building their headquarters among the old ruins. Then one day in Central Park, looking at the people all around him, Limonov decided that he was going to write a novel, but one that would have him as the central figure. It would be about the real experience of America, not the fake democracy. In the book, he described watching Americans in a cafe where he was working as a waiter. It is they, he wrote, who have introduced a plague into this world, the plague of money, the disease of money. The plague of buying and selling is their handiwork. I hate this system, and I am not ashamed that my hatred has sprung from my wife's betrayal. I clear away your leftovers while my wife fucks, and you amuse yourself with her, for the sole reason that there is an inequality. She has a cunt for which there are buyers, you. And I don't have a cunt. I'm going to blow up your world. The book, called It's Me, Eddie, gave a picture of a new reality that Lomonov saw emerging from under the surface of America's everyday life. People think they are free, but really they are becoming like simplified robots, following the rules of money, limited to satisfying only those desires that can be bought and sold. Every publisher he sent it to refused to publish it. But there was another person at the very top of America, in the White House itself, who was also about to expose a frightening reality underneath the surface of the society. In 1978, the president's wife, Betty Ford, revealed that she had become addicted to Valium, an addiction that she said had taken her into a strange state, where even her sense of time had become dislocated. As I look back, it was December, about a year ago, when I realized that there were some sort of blank spots where I had a hard time putting events in their separate slots in time. To me, it was marvelous and beautiful, but to the family, I was beginning to show signs of over-medication. Betty Ford's admission had a dramatic effect. In its wake, stories began to pour out of people all across America who were also addicted to Valium. 
it seemed that there was a private, hidden world of anxiety behind the public faces that affected millions of people. But Arthur Sackler, who in the 1960s had promoted Valium as beneficial and non-addictive, was unrepentant. And a company that he and his two brothers had started was about to develop a new drug, a synthetic form of opium called OxyContin. And that was going to deal with the next wave of anxiety that would hit America. Over the next 20 years, as more and more factories closed because of the cheap goods coming from China, millions of people in the communities would take OxyContin because it made them feel safe, in a bubble, protected from the growing uncertainties around them. And Harry Cordill, who had represented the miners in Appalachia, became certain that the anger under the surface there was going to grow. Please. One day, he said, it would break out and infect the whole of America. How are you, Mrs. Belcher? All right, thank you. In 1990, he discovered he had Parkinson's, and he shot himself. While Kerry Thornley had become convinced that the coincidences in his past were not coincidences, that the CIA had somehow manipulated him to set up Operation Mindfuck. But he had no idea why he had become lost. 20 years before, he and his friend Greg Hill had been early individualists. They believed that they could shape reality the way they wanted. But now, faced with the revelations about how intricate and complex power had become in the modern world, they felt powerless and lost. Thornley had retreated into a dream world of conspiracies. While Greg Hill had become an alcoholic, and was equally lost. He wrote a letter to Thornley about how he had come to believe in nothing. It is not injustice that overwhelms me now, he wrote, but my sheer damn inability to know anything with any deep level of certainty. When despair is deep enough, even death seems pointless. Now I live without justice. I don't know why. I just live it, so be it. And Edward Lomonov would finally get his novel, It's Me, Eddie, published in Russian. It would cause a sensation and its dark vision of the reality behind the rhetoric of American democracy was going to influence an entire generation in Russia. It was the generation to whom the Americans would then try and sell the idea of democracy. All the talk of democracy, the book told them, was just a sham. Really, it was all about the money. Thank you.